I'm joined in the booth by JVL, and we are watching. Well, it says right there uh, something different than than what who we're actually seeing. That that's last round's titles. Uh, I I believe we are seeing the Tian Nguyen versus Daniel Fournier or. Kazutaka Nade, Nade versus Shaheen Sarani. I'm not sure which one we got. There you go. There you see Shaheen Sarani playing against Kazutaka Naide. Naide? I think the names are actually switched here, for what it's worth. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you I go. You see the, see the, the lingering the soul right. sweatshirt there on the right? Mm -hmm. And uh, blue, black control. Shaheen Sarani returns to his roots. Ooh. He was on the zombie deck last weekend, and uh, he said, you know what? It's actually harder to play aggro than it is to play control. <laughs> he, he admitted that last week. He said it's a lot less forgiving than uh, you know, aggro decks are a lot less forgiving than a control deck where you get some ability to just reset the board or just have this ability to, to recover from the early game. I think a lot of that also has to do with the fact that he's been playing control decks for the last 20 years. So when you've been doing one thing for 20 years, obviously doing something different than that is going to not come quite as easily to you. So Metal uh, Dread Wanderer into Metallic Mimic for Kazutaka. And then Shaheen Sarani uh, cycles a hieroglyphic illumination and then uh, follows up with an anticipate at the end of turn two. And, Sculpting uh, his hand here. He Wow, look at this. There's Oof. Liliana, the last hope. He takes out the Metallic Mimic and ticks Liliana up to four. And that's going to be really hard. I, it, Liliana, this is a card we haven't we haven't seen a lot of lately. But you know, I mean, she's won a pro tour. Yeah, this is a very real card. And when you get to play this card on the play against zombies, like we see, Shaheen didn't even have something that affected the board or affected his opponent's hand in the first two turns of the game. And he played this Liliana, and now he's just in a dominant position. And there's a crypt breaker. And in fact, I, I remember uh, the a lot of the Channel Fireball guys were playing with a crypt breaker deck in the pro tour in Hawaii, and it was the rise of Liliana, the last hope that really made that deck, uh, the first surge of zombies, uh, get pushed back. Absolutely. Interesting that, you know, something that creates so many zombies could also destroy them. <laughs> so it takes down the Dread Wanderer, lets Crypt Breaker stick around, takes Liliana up to three. And Kazutaka is stuck on two lands here. Still going to be able to do stuff with uh, the Crypt Breaker making, you know, getting turned stranded cards into zombies. Let's see, Shaheen Sarani cycling a land. He's going to tick up Liliana, take down the Crypt Breaker, and uh, Grasp of Darkness gets cashed in for a 2 2 zombie token. And the control player gets to pass the turn back with five untapped mana. Liliana goes down to two from the attack. And you'll notice Shaheen has multiple copies of Fatal Push in his hand, or multiple copies of removal spells at the very least, at least one Grasp of Darkness, at least one Fatal Push. And he's not choosing to use those on that zombie. He understands that Liliana has the board, you know, solidly under control all by itself. And he can use those. He can hedge those as a resource as he goes forward in the all game. Right. Kazutaka offers up a Diagraph Colossus. There are two zombies in the yard. So it's going to come in as uh, a 4-4. Four, four. But it's going to get Grasp of Darkness. And Liliana is going to tick down. So that's a 0-1 zombie token right now. Yeah, and again, now the, the Liliana just dominating the board. And Shaheen seems to just have his way with this game at this point. <laughs> From the looks of it, he has an Essence Scatter in hand also, so if he needs... Here's a Dark Salvation for one. Makes a zombie. And now we may see Shaheen pick off a zombie here or there. Yeah, I think he even has Yahini's expertise in his hand, from my understanding. So, <laughs> Sphinx of the final word. Not that Kazutaka was going to be countering anything anyway, but... But that's a big body. There you get a look at Sphinx of the Final Word, 5-5, five, five, flying, hexproof, and, you know, oh, yeah, by the way, your spells can't be, your instant sorceries can't be countered. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that it's 5-5 five, five, hexproof here, though, the, you know, the Monoblack Zombies deck has no way to get that off the table. So 
now Shaheen is just going to be able to, you know, attack four times and win the game. Meanwhile, the zombie deck is starting to uh, amass a horde. And that horde's but, going away oh real quick. Oh, my gosh. Yahini's expertise. Look at that. Just wipes the board out of all, all that hard work. Doesn't, uh, doesn't get to cast a spell with it. Does it chooses not to. Yeah, I mean, ideally for Shaheen's deck, he's going to be putting Liliana, the last token to play, when he casts that card, and he's already got one. <laughs> it's on five loyalty. He's in a very comfortable position. All right, Dark Salvation. Make a zombie, but that's not going to be good enough. Yeah, the ceiling on Dark Salvation is so high when you're playing against another creature-based deck, and when you're playing against a deck like this, a blue-black control deck that <clears throat> pretty much has no creatures that are targets for the for that, it's just a disaster. And I think this is going to be a pull from tomorrow. And Oof. You, and you know that's something Shaheen's been waiting to do in a tournament since the moment he saw that card. <laughs> he does things in his own time. Draw, draws five <laughs> cards, discards a land. Wow. A Shaheen Sarani in his natural habitat. Yeah. Swamps and <laughs> islands. <laughs> Goes up to seven. This is so what he was built to do. The zombie, <laughs> the zombie player may find himself overrun with zombies, even if he somehow finds a way to deal with that Sphinx, but he's going to be hard-pressed to do so. Yeah, and that's, that's the game. Wow. Not a great draw there from Kazutaka. It does not really show off fully what the zombie deck could do, but he's able to... Uh, He's able to clean it up with a Sahili's, uh, I mean, a uh, Yahini's expertise. We'll be right back with more of this match right after this. to coverage here. I can tell you that all the players are shuffling on all the tables, so we have no live look-ins to bring you. But let's take a look at uh, Shaheen's deck and see what he's going to do after sideboard. Uh, clearly thinking about Zombies game one, but he has even more to be able to do against them in, in game two. Yeah, you know, the slower cards in his deck, the cards that don't do as much in those early turns, he's going to get to take those out, and he's going to be able to bring in more efficient spells. He's going to be able to bring in... a up to a full play set of Fatal Push, up to a full play set of Yahini's Expertise. He has a couple copies of Complete Disregard in his board. And then, if he wants to, he can even bring in a pair of uh, Kalidas, Trader of Get, which, you know, if, if his opponent ends up taking out all of their removal, which I would be surprised if they did not, then, you know, that's, that's a really hard thing to deal with when you're you know, like a zombie deck. I mean, when they're killing your stuff and making two two zombies themselves while also life linking, it's really hard to get back into a game. Let me ask you a question about Shaheen's deck. As I'm looking through his main uh, list, he has a sum total of four creatures, mm -hmm. but he has two copies of Westvale Abbey in his deck. So, what what is the plan on Westvale Abbey for his deck? Is his plan to 
just be able to stall the game out with, with you know, making tokens and blocking and... Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I think there are situations where Shaheen's opponents will get him on no way to win the game. <laughs> and Westvale Abbey is a way to win the game in those situations. Two might be ambitious, um, but maybe not. I'm, I'm he's sure only, Shaheen he's only it playing two colors, so yeah, it's it's not. You too certainly bad couldn't on his do mana. it in an Esper deck. Yeah, it, it's not the worst on his mana, <laughs> and you know, it's it's not even that unreasonable to imagine a situation where he has a Liliana ultimate and he he's able to create Orban Doll. So we are, we are able to take a, a look in now as we pick up uh, on, on the next table. Raymond Perez Jr., the firm, former Rookie of the Year, playing against Jen Kratz. Uh, I know Jen uh, recently won one of the first uh, Pay It Forward challenges, which is uh, a tournament series about uh, promoting more uh, gender diversity in Magic. Oh, that's awesome. And we saw her last round playing with uh, Black White Zombies. Uh, Raymond Perez playing Teamer Control, and that would indicate to me that that is not an Etherwork Marvel deck. Yeah, he does not have Etherworks Marvel in here. He's instead he's winning the game with Torrential Gear Hulk. And the thing that I really like about what Raymond Perez is doing here is that there is no way, no how that his opponent will not be playing around the Etherworks Marvel combo for the entirety of Game One and likely a good portion of game two and maybe even game three, because it, you know, it's not that unreasonable that your Marvel opponent could have a Torrential Gear Hulk in their deck. And the majority of his cards are cards that could very easily find their way into a Marvel deck. So, you know, especially less experienced opponents will probably be sideboarding in all of their cards to fight the Marvel combo. And Raymond Perez Jr. is going to be playing a deck with counter spells and removal against an opponent that may have up to six dead cards in their deck. Right. Here he uses Radiant Flames to just ignite a little uh, army of zombies. Jen gets an extra card on the way out with her Crypt Breaker. Oof. But look at this. She untaps and plays Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. So we'll give you an update. Uh, looks like Jen is already up a game here. We'll, we'll give you an update on what happens here. In the meantime, we're going to go back to our main table between Shaheen Sarani and Kazutu Kazutuka Naide. Naide hoping for a, a better draw this time around. Doesn't have the one drop, which is pretty important to have when you're playing against these control decks. You want to, you know, apply, you know, if you're able to go one drop, two drop when you're on the play, you have like four points of power on the board before your opponent is able to really establish much pressure. But you know what? We saw this from the zombie decks in, in Nashville. And, you know, a lot of times in game two, they, they tend to have this package, which is trying to disrupt their opponent's game plan. We saw a lot of turn two, uh, transgress the mind, turn three, lost legacy, things like that where they're just trying to dismantle their opponent's uh, game plan. Absolutely, and Transgress the Mind is the, a perfect card for trying to do something like that. Lost Legacy, perhaps not the best in this particular matchup. <laughs> um, one of the problems with Lost Legacy here is that, you know, Shaheen's deck is, you know, not contingent upon doing one thing. Right. Like, his plan A isn't going to be, I'm just going to marvel you out. His, you know, his plan A is, I'm going to outcard you in the long run. And even if you remove all the torrential gear hulks from his deck he'll, he'll eventually kill you with a westfell abbey he'll eventually kill you with a kalidus so a card like lost legacy while it may seem like oh i could side in lost legacy and take my opponent's torrential gear hulks and then how does he win oh that's no, you, not really how you're it dispossessed works. for the torrential gear hulks you, yeah. you <laughs> lost legacy something else i don't think you lost legacy at all <laughs> so i'm trying to say so no play on turn two for shaheen he did cycle on that hieroglyphic illumination after Kalidus was uh, removed from the game with the Transgress. And here is Relentless Dead for Kazutaka Naide. One thing I really like about Hieroglyphic Illumination over Glimmer of Genius in these types of decks is that Shaheen's really mana starved up until the mid game. And then on turns like four and five, it's he's going to have to be using his mana oftentimes to get back into the game. And he won't have time to resolve a spell like Glimmer of Genius. But if he's just cycling a Hieroglyphic Illumination in the early stages of the game, then when he plays that Torrential Gear Hulk on turn six, it's still going to have that powerful effect in his graveyard to flash back. So 
more more land for Knight in this game than he had last game. He goes right up to four on turn four. And here we see a Diagraph Colossus. He's going to follow that up with a Dread Wanderer. And he's going to get a zombie token for his effort. So suddenly, he's gone wide. And Shaheen Sarani needs to find, absolutely needs to find Ahini's expertise here. Yeah, I mean, post-board, we know he has four copies. He grabbed that card real quick and put it into his hand. So that, that may be what we're about to see. Anticipates at the end of turn. There it is. Yahini's expertise. Does he have anything to put into play? Or Nope. Just says that's fine. Yeah, Wrath of God is still a good card. <laughs> There's a Lord of the Accursed as the follow-up. But Nahidi is down to one card. There you see the Westvale Abbey. And the window of opportunity here for Naide is just closing so fast because next turn Shaheen's not only going to have, you know, all of this in his hand as a reactionary measure, but he'll be able to cast Torrential Gear Hulk. And once he does that, he's drawing extra cards. He's putting a huge threat on the battlefield. It's just so hard to come back in the game once your opponent has a Torrential yeah. Gear Hulk. Yeah, there's the magic board. number, six mana. Also lets him, you know, go on to hard mode for the Ormondal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if need be. And uh, opposite, opposite draw this turn for Naide. And there you see the Hieroglyphic Illumination getting cashed in for two cards. Wow. Seventh mana for Shaheen, who goes on O with the Gear Hulk. But actually, it looks like he's got not a ton going on in his hand there. Does have another Grasp of Darkness. I think there's a pull from tomorrow, though. Oh, and that could well, change that in a heartbeat. That is quite a bit. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So he's going to draw five. You see him just that the splay that his fingers to just grab a <laughs> handful of cards. Very few feelings in Magic better than drawing five cards, other than maybe drawing six cards or seven cards. Yeah, I find that my enjoyment of a game of Magic is directly correlated with the amount of cards yeah. I'm drawing at any given moment. Okay, there is Kalidas. There, were, there was more where that came from. And in comes Torrential Gearhulk. Which would have meant that if the Dread Wanderer wanted to uh, do anything, it would have been exiled never to come back again. And that's what's going to happen here with Fatal Push. And a zombie for Shaheen. Yeah, now he's, you know, he's dying for lethal. Wow, there you go. <laughs> Shaheen Sarani. Blue-black control is supposed to be the long match, but uh, made short work here of the mono-black zombies deck. Not not two not great draws there for Naidi. Not not really showcasing the power of the deck. Yeah. But, uh, but land light in the first game, too much land in the second game. But in both happens. games, yeah, Yahini's expertise was uh, probably the the backbreaker. Absolutely. I mean, Naidi did have a. a Super wide board. He had a lot of threats going, and Shaheen was able to just clean all that up with Yahini's expertise in that game, and it easily won the match. All right. We have some more magic coming to you here in round three of Grand Prix Montreal right after this.
Welcome back to the booth here in the middle of round three. Uh, Brian David Marshall and Jacob Van Lunen at Grand Prix Montreal. Not gonna lie, Jake, best laid plans. You know, they're, they're getting people seated for the, in the feature match area. And uh, Brian Braun doing, I mean, uh, Shaheen Sarani is going on the, the back table where, you know, we're gonna do for playback. And like, that's yeah. blue black control. That's crazy. Yeah. Let's get that on the front table. That's gonna take because, forever. That, that match is gonna take forever. <laughs> but of course, Shaheen tur sort of turboed that out. Uh, but we do we do have another match to show you, and we're gonna go and uh, take a look at that right now. Here we see uh, Daniel Fournier at two and zero versus Andrew Noraj, also two and zero. Daniel Fournier, one of the uh, you know big players here in Canada, uh, you know at the sort of the heart of uh, the resurgence uh, of Canadian magic. Yeah, I mean he's had a, you know varied success at the Grand Prix level for the last three, couple of years. Three GP top eights. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and according to, in quotes from Daniel, dead last at the World Magic Cup in 2014, <laughs> as he lists his accomplishments. Hey, getting to play at the World Magic Cup is an achievement in of itself. So and Andrew Norvarai uh, won Grand Prix Top 8, which was here in Montreal in 2011. He's from Ottawa, and uh, he said to say, everyone's happy for the Senators right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> hockey on everyone's minds. Up here in Canada, that's absolutely true. It's a channeler initiate on turn two here from Andrew. Um, now this is a powerful card. This is a card that I've been pretty impressed with when I've been able to, lucky enough to get it in limited. And it produces mana, it ramps you, and then and once Daniel, all is said and done, you have a three, four left over. Uh, and Daniel, Daniel uh, does the, the new updated bolt the bird. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's like, you know what? I'm just going to kill that right now. You see a Whirler Virtuoso from Nor Norvry. And a Whirler Virtuoso from Fournier as well. Fournier with a slight energy advantage here. Has to use one energy to play that Whirler Virtuoso, but gets two of it refunded. All right. And you're being aggressive boxer. with that. Yeah, very aggressive. Yeah. You see both of these players are, are on uh, actually playing Marvels. Yeah, now this is, you know, the, the match we expected to see a lot of this weekend. The, the thing about Teamer Marvel is it's so good. It's, you know, so powerful. And, oh, from the looks of it, Andrew is not playing Teamer Marvel. Andrew is playing the Teamer Energy deck okay, from as, the Pro Tour. As we see from Bristling Hydra, yeah, one now, of the hallmark cards of that, of that archetype. This, this is an interesting deck. I don't know if everybody here has seen this. Uh, I, I'm not sure who it was. Somebody went 8-2 at the Pro Tour with this. It's had a, a bit of very Magic Online success in the last week. This deck... Uh, you know, it's it's a lot like the Marvel deck, but instead of playing Marvel and Ulamog, you instead have Bristling Hydra and Glorybringer, and you know, you and instead of Wood Weaver's Puzzle Knot, uh, you have Elder Deep Fiend as your top end. So, uh, a lot of the time, you get into this, you know, scrap in the mid game, and the deck is able to Elder Deep Fiend the opponent two turns in a row, while it just takes over the game and kills the opponent. You're also able to punch through damage in the late game with Ronus the Indomitable. Absolutely, and, that, and that's a really powerful effect for a deck like this because there's so many creatures in the deck that just passively have four power, which isn't something you see a lot of for decks in standard. So Ronus is turned on naturally without having to activate him in this deck, as opposed to many of the other strategies that are trying to use Ronus to its fullest, you know. So Harvest potential. Lightning is uh, taking down a Whirl of Virtua, so. <laughs> and Andrew's like, okay, I'm going to make a token and then I'm going to cash that in for an Elder Deep Fiend and finish tapping you out. Oh, by the way, I have a 5-6. But another Harness Lightning from Fournier, and he's able to just finish off the Deep Fiend. And there we see the power of Elder Deep Fiend. Fried I mean. Octopus. Delicious. <laughs> it is delicious. <laughs> Get a nice char on it. And, I mean, the thing about Elder Deep Fiend that's so strong there, though, is that... It, you know, he was able to gain card advantage on Daniel, even though that interaction went as well as about as well as it could have for Daniel there. Tireless tracker for Fournier, main deck tireless tracker. Kind of an Throwback. interesting, yeah. <laughs> kind of interesting to see here. 
There's a rogue refiner. And, I, you know, when the question coming into the tournament is what is the correct build of this Marvel deck? Do we want to hedge against this deck? Do we want to hedge against this deck? And you, you're really not sure where you want to go. Tireless Tracker is that middle ground. Well, where now what's the argument against Tireless Tracker cracking the starting rotation in these decks? Like, you see decks that just bring it in in, almost, in so many different matchups, but ra rarely see it like here we do, like we do here, starting, uh, starting the game, in game one. I think the major Excuse issue me. is that in game one, you want to make your plan A as good as possible. And what Tireless Tracker replaces in the second and third games are often cards like Wood Weaver's Puzzle Knot, which in game one, when you're just racing to activate your Aetherworks Marvel, is a really powerful effect. Um, now, the thing about Tireless Tracker is uh, in game one, your opponent may have you know, cards that match up pretty well against it. But in games two and three, they might be forced to take those cards out so that they match up better against your Marvel. So Tireless Tracker is not only a more potent threat in games two and three, but it also replaces your cards that get weaker in the second and third game. So it's it's definitely better in the second and third games when it's coming out of this Marvel deck, but it's one of those cards that's just universally strong. And, you know, if you don't know what deck you're trying to beat, if you just want to have like a middle of the road version of the deck that's good against everything, then Tireless Tracker is a great main deck inclusion. I, I think Daniel Fournier has realized that the the, the gig is up here because he, you know, he's holding the gate. And he's like, yeah, I'm not playing against the Marvel deck yeah. because he just, you know, committed resources to the board to such a degree that he doesn't have the gate open to him. But he, he realizes that Marvel is not something. Once, I think once you see the bristling Hydra, you're yeah. not expecting to see Etherwork Marvel from your opponent. But wow, look at this. An Elder Deep Fiend's going to tap down Daniel's board, and that should be enough. Not it's quite, he's one, one shy, short. yeah. It's gonna be one short. Oh, but of course, Daniel gets to make two tokens as well. He has to make two thopters. So he's at least he's chumping gonna, with one of them, make I one. imagine. And he chump blocks the Wrestling Hydra. Holding only in the gate in hand, what's he gonna draw? draw. Not a bad draw step. Is that Harness Lightning? Or, oh, that was Chandra, Chandra. Flame Caller. Oh, look at this. The thing is, is that, you know, he can Wrath away everything but the Elder Deep Fiend here, and then an attack from Andrew puts him down to one, and he doesn't have the Chandra anymore. Wow. So, not the best spot for Daniel, even though he drew a card that was one of the better cards he could have drawn in this spot. Yeah, and if he Chandra's, he really has to Chandra for four because he wants to get rid of that Bristling Hydra. Absolutely. Wow. What is the play here for Fournier? Yeah, now, true. it's also possible that he could play the Chandra, realizing that he's not going to win with the sweep, play it, and just zero it, right? discard his hand, draw deeper, and hope to get to some combination of cards that'll let him Ulamog next turn. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess he does have three energy. He does have three blockers. It, he could buy himself a little bit of time here. He has to go down to two energy to play Chandra because he needs to use the Servant of the Conduit. Now, what, what is the play? Up, down. It's certainly not going to be plus one. So it's really zero. Oh, he's going to go just... For one. And, you know, I actually like this play a lot. I think that, you know, it forces Andrew to get cute with his attacks. Like, he has to decide where he's going to put those attacks. Like, is he going for the face? Is he going for Chandra? You know, oh. Here's another Elder Deep Fiend, and that's going to tap down everything. And wow, Andrew Norvarai gets in for the win. Elder Deep Fiend looking great here yeah. in game one. And that's a card, too, that just gets better in multiples. You know, like, not obviously not in your opening hand, but once the game starts getting to that stage, the more of those you draw, you can kind of... It, it has this feel to it, like you lock your opponent out of the game. You know, we've, we've seen decks in the past that, you know, like the interaction of having a chain of Elder Deep Fiends so much that they're willing to go through the, you know, the stress of playing a card like Sanctum of Ugin. And that's how powerful chaining those together can be. Uh, Andrew's deck obviously not doing that, but... You know, you're looking at these cards like Rogue Refiner, these cards like Whirler Virtuoso that do so much without needing to be on the board for very long. And 
you know, when you're casting another Deep Fiend for just four mana by sacrificing a creature that already drew your card and gave you some energy, that's a really nice deal. And it's really good at forcing through damage in a matchup where they're very often board stalls. Now, look, looking at the player sideboards, what, what are we expecting to see happen? I mean, I think Daniel knows he probably, it looks like his deck is, you know, with a couple of negates in the main deck, like optimized for this Marvel, for what he was expecting to be Marvel mirrors, right? Yeah, I mean, with those negates in the main deck, it looks like Daniel was expecting more mirror than anything else. He has, you know, a pair, a pair of tireless trackers and a pair of negates where a lot of other people would have had you know, different cards. Like, he's only playing three copies of Whirler Virtuoso. Uh, his deck is, you know, it definitely just moving in that direction of expecting more and more Marvel. Uh, and I think that might be the correct place to be this weekend. Um, his opponent, on the other hand, gets to go up to four copies of Negate. Wow. Now, the what's weird is that this is kind of mirror matchy, but the way they sideboard is completely different. Like, Daniel wants to take these negates out of his deck. Daniel wants to take these tireless trackers out of his deck, these cards that are, you know, too long gamey. He wants to, you know, fight that. Like, he just wants to stay on board. Like, Confiscation Coup is a great card of the board here for Daniel. Um, whereas when you're looking at Andrew's sideboard plan, Andrew wants to bring in cards to prevent Daniel from going off with his Aetherworks Marvel. So, so you, we might see a Manglehorn come in. Yeah, I imagine we're going to see Manglehorn. We're going to see a uh, play set of negate. Um, we, we may see a single copy of Magma Spray. We may see, you know, some number of Chandra Torture Defiance. Uh, As you expect these game twos to go a little more grindy out of the um, Marvel player, do you see something like Lifecrafter's Bestiary coming in? Yeah, I, I could definitely see him bringing in the single copy of Lifecrafter's Bestiary. I think that... You know, there are definitely matchups where he'd want it more. For example, had he been playing against, you know, the blue-black control deck that we had just watched, that would be a perfect place for that. But if he's expecting this match to go longer, then that can be a really nice card to bring in. Of course, if he's tested this match, though, and he's found that it's very hard to, you know, get that going while also leaving open the counter magic necessary to counter Aetherworks Marvel, then, you know, it might just not be worth it. <laughs> And I think one of the major advantages that Daniel has in the post-boarded matchups is that Daniel, not fearing Marvel combo, can tap out every turn trying to apply pressure and put threats on the board. Whereas Andrew, as soon as Daniel is threatening to resolve a Marvel, needs to start leaving open negate mana. Right. And that's and we, really dangerous. And we saw that from Fournier in game one. There was a point where, I mean, he obviously didn't win the game, but there was a point where he's like, okay, my opponent is not playing Marvel. I don't need to sit back on this negate anymore and I can commit more cards to the board and use all my, almost all my mana this turn, which I thought was a really interesting pivot from Fournier as he was uh, seeing how the game played out. Again, we have perfect knowledge of, of the deck lists here. These guys don't yeah. quite know what's up yet. Yeah, Daniel, at least until turn four there, did not know that Andrew did not have access to Aetherworks Marvel. I mean, and still, still can't be 100% certain, but you have a pretty good idea. Once you see the Elder Deep Fiends, once you see the, the Bristling Hydra, you're like, okay, I think, I think I know what you're doing. There can't be room for all of those with <laughs> the Marvel, right? I don't know. You know, those, those cards are, are pretty exciting. Uh, Elder Deep Fiend's pretty exciting off of a uh, Aetherworks Marvel, no? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a nice hit. You only have so many top end slots, though. It's, it's, it's hard to justify that one. Well, I think people did at some point or another. See the smiley face from Andrew. The oh, old, aggressive old, play, aggressive old, play. Old school smiley face. <laughs> I like it. Now you see a marvel in the opening hand for Fournier. Is that he's keeping his hand, but Andrew, frowny face, he's mulliganing. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like Andrew there had a, a hand that was, I think it was four lands and a tune with Ether, a Bristling Hydra, and a Glorybringer. And while that may be somewhat tempting, you're like, oh, it's a four land, three spell hand where I can cast all my spells. But nothing on the early game. Yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't do anything until the fourth turn of the game. And you're not going to win a game of Magic, especially on the draw, when you don't do anything until turn four. So uh, wisely ch choosing to mulligan there. There you see a Sweltering Suns in the hand also for Daniel Fournier. That's one of his uh, sideboard options. Yeah, and that's going to be great in this matchup. Also, you know, Daniel's able to go to a more 
energy aggro plan if he wants to, too. He's got long tusk cubs in his board. And I like that a lot. He gets to, you know, I don't know if that's what he pressure. Did, but it's kind of cool. Yeah, it's going to be hard for him to do that at the same time as sideboarding against Sweltering Suns. I think that's a. Uh, you probably want to be doing one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, now the thing that I really like about Daniel's list, though, is, you know, the the options he has between his main deck and sideboard. I think one of the reasons those tireless trackers are in his main deck is because he didn't have room in his sideboard for them. Like in a sideboard, he does have the two extra copies of tireless tracker here. But, you know, if he's going to have room in his sideboard to turn his deck into an aggressive strategy, to turn his deck into a more controlling strategy, where we see that he can go up to four negates post board, he can instead be on a four long tusk cub plan post board, then he's really going to want to, you know, have access to some of those sideboard cards in his main deck. And if you're going to put some, move some of your sideboard to the main deck to make more room in the board, then Tireless Tracker is definitely your first option there. All right, well, we are underway. And there is turn two, Sermon of the Conduit, which is going to mean a turn three Aetherwork Marvel is uh, a possibility. Yeah, that's definitely something Andrew's going to have to worry about here. He ha also has a Servant. Of course, still a little bit away from uh, having the crucial sixth mana, I mean, sixth energy to activate that Marvel. Yeah, the, the one thing that's scary here for Daniel is that, you know, he could use this opportunity to resolve a Marvel, but in doing so, he, oh, he goes down to get Megalhorned. Yeah, and he goes yeah. down in energy to do it because he has to, of course, tap the servant. I like that he just took the opportunity to stick it, though, because the odds of your opponent having a Manglehorn that is likely just a one of, if at all, in their right. board here, um, it's, you know, not that great. And you know that your opponent's definitely bringing in cards to get the Marvel, you know, in, in for terms of counter magic. So, yeah, now he's got six energy. He gets to spin. Yeah, Rogue Let's Refiner was the play see. from... Oh, I love it. I love it. I love oh, it. Oh, look it. at Whoa. that! <laughs> My brain. <laughs> this is your brain on Etherwork Mar Marvel. Etherwork Marvel. Incredible. Tireless, tireless tracker is the hit. Not quite as exciting as I hoped it would be. Marvel's still spinning. Still spinning. <laughs> if it's still spinning, does that mean you maybe get another card? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the rules are on the the spinning of the Marvel. That was great. You see confiscation coup in hand there for Daniel. Of course, now uh, there were, he does have some more man, man in hand. I'm going to say his servant is offline at the moment. But the land gets him a clue, and then he can start cashing those clues in for energy as he starts to rebuild towards another Marvel spin. Yeah, and those clues then produce energy, which then turn on the servant. It's Servant attacks into the Rogue Refiner. A wild Marshall Sutcliffe spotted walking into the future match area, looking pretty refreshed. Yeah, I heard he, he got in around 4 a.m. last yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, pretty brutal. <laughs> All right. Five mana Glory Bringer is the play for Andrew Norvarai, and he exerts Glory Bringer and shoots down that tireless tracker. One energy for Fournier. And the Whirler Virtuoso gets trades with the Rogue Refiner. A little bit more energy for Fournier. Now untaps. The thing I really like about Fournier's game plan here is that, you know, just by trading aggressively here, it makes it so hard when you play this team or energy deck when your opponent just has the Marvel in play. Because every time you're trading, you're just working them up to more and more spins. And eventually, they're going to hit an Ulamog, and things are not going to go especially well for you. So Daniel Fournier walks away from the table. He's asking a question to the judge. And based on his hand, I'm assuming he's asking about confiscation coup. And yeah. the question is going to be, if he confiscates that glory bringer that's exerted, when does it untap? Does it skip his next untap? You know, he's trying, he's, I think he's trying to figure this out. Does it untap as normal on his turn 
or is it like does it I believe somehow it does untap as normal on his next turn yeah uh because exert reads your next untap step so i believe it would be andrew's next untap step is when that glory bringer was set, said that it would not be untapping so it does not untap on your next but if it's his next untap step it's fine that's my understanding <laughs> Yeah, and, that, and that's, uh, yeah, I'm getting word in my ear. That is exactly what he's checking up on. And uh, he wants to be sure here. I think he got a tentative yes and is looking for a hard yes. Yeah. <laughs> Believes yes. Judge says yes. He wants I, to double check with another judge. Other judge says yes. <laughs> Sounds good. Glorybringer is such an awesome card. That's such, it's such a nice, like, answer to planeswalkers it's such a nice planeswalker in of itself in so many ways yeah i mean really it's, it's like the it is the antithesis of gideon right yeah they, they, they're locked in mortal combat which I, th I think the format needed that in a lot of ways i mean glorybringer is like we haven't had you know a thunder Maw, hellkite storm breath dragon kind of card and glorybringer gives us that and it's it's a really powerful version of that type of card like the big red hasty flyer um the way it just kills a creature turn and enters the battlefield uh you sometimes need to get be smart about the way you play it it's not a good card to play into a lot of untapped lands uh it's a card that you want to be exerting as aggressively as you possibly can um in a deck like andrews he can actually set up turns where he taps out his opponent with elder deep fiend and then can use just the four damage out of nowhere as a way to assassinate opponents and just kill them so there's a lot of play to Glorybringer in general. I think there's even more play to Glorybringer when it's coming out of a deck like Andrew's. And, and also, you know, an exerted Glorybringer is a fine thing for a octopus to rip out of the husk of. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not going to untap next turn anyway. I might as well just pay this two mana here. Yeah. Because I had already used my other mana for other things. I got to tell you, I, I'm really liking the look of Andrew's team or energy deck. This deck, this deck looks kind of sweet and maybe gets to play around some of the hate people are bringing in for this, for the Marvel decks. And maybe even get some, like, you know, some weak sideboarding for game two from some people. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure if you lose game one and your opponent didn't see Elder Deep Fiend, they're likely sideboarding like Or you're even playing. if you win game one. Okay. Yeah. So Daniel has gotten the ruling he, he was looking for. He's going to confiscation coup. The glory bringer it's going to untap as normal on his turn it's still exerted i believe technically it's still exerted plays another land says go where does andrew go from here another glory bringer oh, how about another nice. glory bringer yes still has the energy from if he doesn't have another land So you just glory bringer, kill glory bringer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it turns out that glory bringer matches up pretty nicely against glory bringer. Yes. The second one is better than, than the first one. And that's what we're going to see. Glory bringer number two. Exert. Or did he not exert? Chose not to exert. That seems odd. Wow. All right, Daniel cracks a clue. Holding sweltering suns in his hand. Interesting. I wonder what the game plan here was. So Harness Lightning takes down the Glorybringer. Glorybringer is going to exert, take down the Servant of the Conduit. A lot of interesting things happening there. I'm surprised that Daniel didn't, first of all, use his Glory Bringer to kill the Glory Bringer. Yeah. Thereby needing to use less energy with that Harness Lightning. Uh, I'm surprised that the, you know, the, there's a number of things happening there. Here's Bristling Hydra. No energy for Daniel in terms of activating his Aetherwork Marvel, but that all changes in an instant here. Yep. There's Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. He's going to be able to sacrifice it. Go to seven energy. 
because he also gets one when his uh, Wood Weaver's Puzzle Knock goes to the graveyard. Yeah, now he gets to spin this marble. Yep. Here we go. Uh, no, no, no actual spin, Daniel. He's not going to actually spin. I, well, it was, it was unlucky. Right. Oh, I'm excited. I'm it excited. was unlucky. Oh yeah, yeah. You don't want to run it back. It didn't work the first time. I understand that. <laughs> All right. Well, he's going to miss again, but gets halfway back or two thirds of the way back to being able to activate again next turn with a rogue refiner. You're also going to, you know, force Andrew to use a lot of energy if he wants to clean up the board here when Andrew attacks. Uh-oh, I see a double Ula Mulligan for Daniel Fournier. So two Ula Mogs in hand. He does run four in his version. We saw a couple versions at the Pro Tour only running three. I think I actually historically have a much higher hit rate on Aetherworks Marvel when I have two Ulamogs in hand than when I have no Ulamogs in hand. <laughs> Half is likely not to happen. This is not scientifically proven, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, overwhelming anecdotal evidence. I love situations like that where like the map is completely flipped. You don't have a lot of sample size. Oh, there's Ronus. And that, that's an innovation to Andrew's version of the deck. I believe the Pro Tour version of the Teamer Energy deck with the other Deep Fiends and Glorybringers did not have Ronus. Yeah, and now Ronus is online, right? It can attack and block as long as that Bristling Hydra's there. Bristling Hydra, pretty difficult to deal with. Ronus, indestructible, pretty difficult yeah. to deal with. Here we see Sweltering Suns getting cycled by Daniel Fournier. And I mean, that's a sideboard card for Daniel. Daniel was probably pretty happy to have them in his opening hand. And the nice part about Sweltering Suns is that, you know, if your opponent's draw doesn't match up well for Sweltering Suns to be at its absolute very best, then you can just cycle it and replace it with another card. And here, Andrew, you know, the cards he's got on the table, those, you know, are completely unaffected by How it. much damage can Andrew force through here? Not enough. Not enough. Daniel's yeah, not yeah. necessarily forced to block here. Definitely not. All right, but in comes Ronus. Yeah, Ronus. Ronus can only give another creature. Um, plus two plus here. Oh, no, that's not true. Uh, no, I, yes, it is true. I'm sorry. Stepping on my own thoughts. Um, but Daniel has options here. Daniel can just jump block here and pick up a little bit of energy if he wants to. He can also just fall to 13. Uh, of course, the reason that the glory bringer didn't kill the glory bringer, yeah, it's can't non kill dragons. non dragon. Class. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, and they did that so that the glory bringer chain yeah. doesn't yes, yes. become a, a boring form of magic. Absolutely. <laughs> what we need is a coffee bringer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we see Elder Deep Fiend. Sacrifice the Bristling Hydra. Tap your creatures. Andrew gets to untap. Yeah, and he could just go for victory here. It's exciting. I mean, there, Daniel could have blocked the last turn, and Elder Deep Fiend doing weird things. Yeah, we know Daniel's holding a couple of Ulamogs. Andrew's got to be thinking, you know, running through, saying, what is he holding? But got an attack for 10 on the table. Pump, pump. Show him the hand. Wow. Andrew Norvarai yeah. gets the match. And, and that's what Elder Deep Fiend does. It's incredible. Yeah, card, yeah. card looked great there. The way, the way you can control a board, the way you can win games out of nowhere. I mean, it was just incredible. All right, well, that's it for the match here. Uh, we'll be back with uh, more action after this.